Good afternoon. It's September 11th, 2020, and this is episode 11 of Rob Explains, your daily podcast discussing and explaining cool, random, and interesting things. I'm Rob. Thanks for joining me. Today is a somber day, and this episode may run a little longer than previous episodes, so I apologize in advance. But it's rare that I've had an opportunity to speak into a microphone on September 11th, uh, the actual day, and talk about the events and talk about my how it impacted me and, and how my life changed on that day. Uh, I find it strange. Uh, in my other job, my day job, my real job, I actually work with a lot of Gen Zers. And the oldest of Gen Z officially turned 18 this year. And the oldest of Gen Z officially turned 18 last year. Gen Z, or Generation Z, is officially determined by those people to whom September 11th is a historical event. For me, it is not a historical event. I remember exactly where I was on that morning, September 11th, 2001. I was a senior in high school at North Carolina High School in North in Ridgely, Maryland. Um, I was in statistics class uh, early in the morning when my teacher, whose son was attending school in New York and was actually supposed to be in the city for a trip that morning, was rushed out of the room by another member of the staff and she went running to the front office. That was our first clue that something was up. The next period I had sociology. Uh, I was a senior level sociology class and it was very laid back and the teacher actually brought out a TV and he said, this is something you're going to want to remember. He said he remembered where he was when he had heard that President Kennedy had been shot and he remembered where he was when the Challenger exploded and he felt as though this was going to be the same kind of memory and he wanted us to be able to watch. So we watched on TV as the second plane hit the uh, second tower. And shortly thereafter, school was dismissed and we were sent home. As a senior, I had my car, so I was able to grab my sister and able to leave. And then I went home and watched on TV for the rest of the day, uh, all of the events that we would see happen. The weeks and months after that were very confusing. I had kind of already planned out my life and I knew what I was planning on doing with the rest of my life. I was going to go to college, run in politics, that was going to be it. But now I was starting to feel that burning sensation like I needed to do something. Military recruiters, uh, not unseen ever at my high school, showed up in force in the months afterward. And a lot of my friends actually signed up to go into the military because of how they felt, that same feeling I was having. I didn't. Uh, I ended up going on to college and on from there. But it's hard for people to understand the way that we felt in October 2001. Uh, I can most easily say that I imagine it's exactly how men my age felt on December 8th, 1941. We had been attacked and we wanted to go do something about it. Now, hindsight may give us different clarity on that may give us different clarity on the wars that we have fought since then, the constant state of war that we've been in, giving up civil liberties, the impact to travel, the impact on our entire lives. But in those months after 9-11, I realized that I had become a changed person. And I think that everyone I knew who was my age, around my age, in high school, even middle school, and older, was changed. And that's why, of course, Generation Z are people for whom... September 11th was a historical event because they didn't experience what life was like before September 11th. In the summer of 2001, I actually took a trip to the UK. And although there wasn't no security, it wasn't the 1970s where we just walked in and went to the plane, it certainly was much less security. Uh, I flew again in middle of 2002, towards the fall of 2002, and I was astounded by the difference between my flight just a year before, where... We had gone through security, put my bag up on the x-ray machine and walked through with my jacket and my shoes and my belt and everything on. My belt set off the uh, alarm, they wanded me quickly, and then off we went. And just a little while later, a year later, um, belt, shoes, phone, everything from your pockets into the bin, 
and uh, shuffle through in your socks. In the years since then, traveling has been maybe even more inconvenient. New machines, new rules about how much liquid you can carry, what you can actually take, laptops out, everything. It's uh, been a bigger change in the years since than it even was there at the beginning. But today, on this day, I just wanted to bring you some facts and figures from 9-11 as a reminder of what that day meant and who was impacted. At the World Trade Center site, the two buildings known as WTC-1 and WTC-2 and including WTC-7, which would later fall due to structural problems, 2,753 people were killed. They were killed when United Flight 175 and American Airlines Flight 11 were hijacked and then flown into the towers. The planes hitting the towers caused a structural deficit, which then caused the towers to collapse. Of those victims, 343 were New York City firefighters, 23 were New York City police officers, and 37 were officers of the Port Authority, which actually controlled the buildings. The victims ranged in age from 2 to 85 years old, and strangely, 75 to 80 percent of the victims were men. In Washington, well, Northern Virginia, at the Pentagon, 184 people were killed when American Airlines Flight 77 was hijacked and flown into the building. Near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, 40 passengers and crew were killed aboard United Airlines Flight 93 when it crashed into a field there. It's believed that the hijackers may have crashed intentionally rather than going on to whatever their initial goal was. And I do remember on the day they talked about the Capitol building or the White House being one of the possible targets, two in New York, two in D.C. But that the the crew and the passengers attempted to retake the aircraft and the hijackers crashed the plane rather than allowing them to. At 8.46 a.m., while I was in my statistics class, American Airlines Flight 11, traveling from Boston to Los Angeles, struck the North Tower. A few minutes later, after I had moved to sociology, at 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175, also traveling from Boston to Los Angeles, struck the South Tower. 9.37 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77, uh, traveling from Dulles to Los Angeles, uh, struck the Pentagon. At 9.59 a.m., the South Tower collapsed. That collapse took about 10 seconds. At 10.03 a.m., we heard that United Airlines 93 had crashed uh, it was traveling from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, uh, and it crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. At 10.28 a.m., the North Tower also collapsed. And the time between the first strike and the towers collapsing was 102 minutes. All told, 2,977 people were killed. And as of October 2019, 1,645 of the 2,753 people at the World Trade Center, uh, their remains have been positively identified, which means 40%, approximately, of the people who died have not yet been identified. And that's 19 years after the incident. I remember them talking about Middle Eastern terrorists and terrorism in the weeks after 9-11. Uh, I believe, if I remember, that the the link was because the World Trade Center had been attacked before, back in 1993, and they believed it might be the same group. But of course, people also talked about domestic terrorists after the 95 bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma. But in December of 2001, uh, the government released a tape of Osama bin Laden, uh, the leader of a group we call Al-Qaeda, taking responsibility for the attacks. And I remember at that point... That being my most fervent, where I said, now we know who, um, now we should go get him. And if I had ever been closer to signing up for the military, it was at that moment. In 2002, we began the war in Afghanistan. In 2003, we moved that war to Iraq for reasons which remain unclear, unclearly connected to September 11th. On May 30th, 2002, cleanup at Ground Zero officially began. On May 30th, 2002, cleanup at Ground Zero officially ended. There is some really epic pictures of President Bush coming in uh, on the first days after. 
and firemen continuing to stay on site to dig through debris uh, it had taken from September 12th until May in order to to finish that cleanup. 3.1 million hours of labor were used to clean up 1.8 million tons of debris. The total cost of the cleanup, just the cleanup alone, was $750 million, and those costs don't include the continuing health care costs for not only the victims of the families, not only other victims who were in South Manhattan on that day, but also every person who went to the site who was exposed to toxic and dangerous materials during the cleanup. In the mid-2000s, uh, it was announced that they would be building a new building on the World Trade Center site. Uh, it would be the Freedom Tower. It wouldn't be built in the footprint of the World Trade Center. And if you've been to New York or if you live in New York or if you have a chance to visit, I highly, highly suggest going to the 9-11 Memorial. There are two waterfalls in the footprints of the buildings. The unidentified victims will remain in a repository there at the 9-11 site, uh, hoping for better DNA testing that may be able to identify them. Three victims were identified in 2009 thanks to advances in DNA technology, so the hope is obviously that that will continue and we'll be able to identify 100% of the victims. I think that it's hard to separate an event from its eventual outcomes. And it's inevitable that we draw a line from 9-11 through the war in Afghanistan, which became the longest combat operation uh, in U.S. history uh, sometime in, in the early 2010s, uh, from there to Iraq, and from there to the GWAT, or the Global War on Terror, which has taken us to Asia, Africa, Europe, South America, and North America, otherwise known as six of the seven continents. There is a chance that an American serviceman who served in Afghanistan in 2002 gave birth to a son or daughter who would later still serve in that same conflict. That's a long war, and we are still fighting it even today. So when we speak about victims, it's important to remember not only those lost on the day of, not those lost in the weeks and months afterward, not those that we've lost in the two decades past because of the cleanup or the exposure on that day, but also the thousands of lives lost by American servicemen and the likely hundreds of thousands of lives lost by civilians and non-combatants in um, those theaters of war. So while today, 19 years later, it may just feel like any other day, I hope you take a moment to somberly reflect on an event which calls the division of a generation from millennial generation to generation Z. Those of us who were changed by 9-11 and those who only remember it as a historical event. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Rob Explains. Look for new episodes daily wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode. Find us online on all social media at Rob Explains. Got a comment, question, or query? Or did I get something wrong and you want to correct me? Shoot me an email, rob at robexplains.com. Or you can leave a comment down below. I'll check those right after the show goes live. And you can send me a message, anchor.fm forward slash Rob Explains forward slash message. And in the form of a voicemail, I can actually include it in a future episode. Once again, thank you for joining me. Until next time, this is Rob. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have a great day.